Well, it's a great pleasure and privilege to have a chance to talk to James Scott. James, I always ask by, can I call you James? I hope I may. Or Jim. Or Jim. What, what do you people call you? Jim? Jim. Jim. Okay. Jim, um, I usually start by uh, asking you when and where you were born. Well, I was born in a small town in New Jersey, uh, between Camden and Trenton along the Delaware River, um, where my father was uh, a doctor. Uh, when was this? In 1936, yeah. December 2nd. <laughs> I know that in telling, in talking about one's biography, there's this effort to create a kind of false coherence to uh, yes. the story. Um, and the reason why it's a little difficult is because I don't believe such a coherence uh, actually exists except ex post facto. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, so uh, you can't believe a word I say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at least in terms of the sequence that I've mm. put together, um, the I I grew up. Um, my father, as I said, was a physician, mm. and he settled in the small town, which was an industrial town. And um, he died when I was nine years old. Mm. Um, and the I think this is during the second. He died in 1946. And there were, th I think, three doctors in the town. The other two were drafted into the armed services, and he was declared unfit because he had high blood pressure. And the net result was, of course, he was the only doctor, uh, probably a lot busier than he would have been if he'd been in the armed services. <laughs> and he had a stroke um, in 1946. And um, its effect on me, I think, was that we went from being relatively well-to-do. In those days, doctors weren't paid enormous salaries compared to the general civilian population, but my father was relatively well-to-do in this small town. Uh, and uh, my mother had no particular skills, had been raised in a rather privileged background, but with not a lot of money. And so she had no resources, and so we went from being among the relatively well-to-do people in this town to being uh, about the poorest people. I didn't have a sense of uh, deprivation at all, but um, the reason for telling the story is because I went to a small Quaker school, and this Quaker school, uh, I was part of its largest graduating class in history, which was 38 people. The class ahead of me was 18, the class mm -hmm. behind me was 15, and it was it was a day school. It wasn't a boarding it wasn't a boarding school. And when, after my father died, my mother couldn't afford to keep me at the school. So she's about to take me out. And I became then the first scholarship student at the school in return for working weekends in the summer. They uh, waived my tuition. And this Quaker school was, in fact, um, my salvation. It was a, it was a surrogate I think that my academic achievements come in part from having, uh, my mother was an alcoholic, I might add, too, although I didn't know it at the time, but she didn't function very well. So the school became a very important focus of my... a boarding school or a... a day school. Day school. A day school. Uh, and I think that pleasing those teachers became a very important part of my standing in the world and my sense of myself. And I think I was a good student in part because I wanted to these teachers. The other thing to be said about this Quaker school is they did things that a public school or a, a grammar school, a government school, couldn't possibly have done. That is to say, we had things like week-long work camps in Philadelphia, and we would go and work with a black slum family painting and plastering their house. We would uh, go to dock worker meetings, we would go to Communist Party meetings, uh, front organizations, we would eat at settlement houses, uh, people off the street, we would visit prisons, we would visit the state mental institutions. We, in a sense, got a chance as 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds to see the kind of underbelly of Philadelphia in a way that no 
um, government school would have possibly been all, uh, able to allow their students to do without uh, a lot of trouble. It was voluntary to do this. And so I think that the Quakers, um, they also at that time, of course, had a lot of people who were conscientious objectors during the Second World War, which was an extremely unpopular uh, way to conduct yourself. And they taught me, uh, for which I'm everlastingly grateful, or they put in front of me, if you like, uh, people every day who had the capacity to stand up in a crowd of 100 and be a minority of one. Uh, and that kind of Quaker courage uh, actually was infectious to me. So I have taken that on board. So if you want me to stand up in a crowd of 100 and be a minority of one, I'm your man. Uh, on the other hand, I'm completely not brave in other ways, so if you show me the instruments of torture, hmm. uh, I will betray my family, my children, and hmm. anyone else in the room, I think. So, uh, but at that kind of bravery, that kind of civic bravery, um, I found impressive, and it had a great deal of influence on me. Right. Lots of things come out of that. I mean, just not to miss the opportunity, the ob obviously, and perhaps we'll come back to this later, your interest in was in India called subaltern studies, i.e., well, you know, the weapons of the week and all this, um, seems so obviously related to the fact that you were seeing people in prisons and, and marginalized people from very early on and seeing that they were humans and that they were striving against right. authority. Right, and, and although I briefly became a Quaker, but I consider myself to be a lapsed Quaker, I mm. rarely go to Quaker meetings, the um, the Quaker doctrine of the, the light of God in every man uh, and the history of Quaker social action, whether it's uh, in education for Native Americans, whether it's in assisting in the Underground Railroad um, and prison uh, work. Uh, I admired the Quakers enormously for that, and that did rub off. And in fact, the book, a book I wrote called Domination in the Arts of Resistance, I actually dedicated to Morristown Friends School, the name of the particular school, and and devoted my royalties mm. uh, to the school as well as a mark of the, uh, the gratitude that I felt um, uh, I owed them. Uh, mm. And they, I mean, the nicest thing that's ever happened to me, I think, is there's someone named Alice Paul. There, in the struggle for women's suffrage in America, there were eight key women, uh, most of whom were Quakers, uh, and Alice Paul was one of them. She happened to be a graduate of my little school in the very, very early years, and they created an Alice Paul Award. She was one of these people who, um, they were force-fed, I think they went to prison and refused to eat uh, for demonstrating, and they were, they were force-fed. And uh, the school created an award in the name of Alice Paul. And I was its first recipient, and I've never been as <laughs> proud of anything. I didn't actually know who Alice Paul was until I got the award, but uh, I was extremely proud of that. Um, the, uh, where shall I go from here? Well, let's go back, because let I, being anthropologists in particular, I like to go back, if possible, even further than parents. Did you know your grandparents at all? Or what, um, what they did? Or? Yes, I... I was, uh, I didn't know my parents on my mother's side. Um, my, my mother's side actually were kind of socially prominent in Philadelphia two generations before my mother, and then the generation before my mother and, and continuing into my mother's generation is, is as if they all received a signal from God to drink themselves to death, and they did, uh, more or less. So they completely died out, and... Uh, I think my mother's mother died in childbirth, uh, and so she was adopted by her uncle and her aunt, uh, and I heard fond stories about her adopted father, uh, her uncle, uh, but I never met him. Mm. And I did, however, a, a force in my life, I suppose, was my grandmother and grandfather um, on my father's side. They were from, they were from West Virginia, uh, of sort of Scottish Welsh background, uh, Parry, Salmons, uh, and so on. And the um, 
my grandmother was one of those classical Methodist striving. Um, I recognized her in E.P. Thompson's chapter on Methodism <laughs> uh, as making of the working class. But she strived for the success of all her children growing up in West Virginia with almost no money. And she, my grandfather was a salesman to mining stores and could live anywhere in his territory. And she decided that they ought to live in Morgantown, West Virginia, which is the place where the University of West Virginia is located. And they built a big brick house and they became a boarding house for junior professors whose laundry they did and whom they fed. And all of her five children went to the University of West, uh, University of West Virginia. Um, and she drove them all. Um, she was the kind of person who, if you got five A's and a B would criticize you for the B rather than praising <laughs> you for the A. And all the children disliked her actually, but they realized how responsible she was for the success they, um, they achieved in life. And the, um, uh, she had aspirations. So she was obviously one of these women who would have probably done very well had it been a time when she could have had a career of her own, uh, but whose substitute for the career was a career was writing poetry, being active locally, driving her children to distraction, uh, and so on. And I was kind of apple of her eye, um, and I think she lived long enough to see me graduate from Williams College. Uh, and I was, it was a mixed blessing because not many of her kids liked her all that much, but I was conscious of being the apple of her eye, uh, and that it meant something to her for me to achieve some uh, academic excellence. Uh, so that, uh, that coal mining, West Virginia, hard scrabble um, striving that I suppose one could find in the coal country of Wales as well mm. um, at the same time was uh, an important part. And I think for my father, uh, my mother was fond of pointing out that my father's dream was that one of his children would go to Harvard. Well, I never went to Harvard, but uh, <laughs> I did okay. Yeah. Let's, uh, well, just finally, you didn't have brothers or sisters? Or I did. I have an older brother. Yeah. I have an older brother. Uh, it's a complicated story in the sense that my older brother, whom I actually adore, is, uh, has had a working class life. Mm. Um, and it turned out that he... Um, he went to a small Quaker school as well, not the same one, and was naturally left-handed, and they insisted that he write with his right hand, and it had the result that I guess it has in many such cases. It gave him a terrible speech defect, and the speech defect sapped his confidence uh, in the world, and he was, didn't do well in school, and end up, ended up being um, either the lowest level of management or the highest uh, member of the working class in a factory mm -hmm. doing tests for the quality of colors in uh, a factory that made plastics. Uh, and so he had, uh, he was eight years, nine years older than I am and fought in the Korean War and had, uh, to show you the difference in our lives, he had not been in a, on a plane in 30 years and I took him to Korea to revisit the battlefields and mm -hmm. uh, his military history and delighted at that, but uh, it was a completely, it's the first time he's ever been out of the country except for hmm. having been on a troop ship hmm. to Korea. So, uh, yeah, I do have a brother, but he's had a very different, hmm. very different life than I. And just to, just to finish off on those things, you mentioned your mother was alcoholic, but you didn't realize it. I mean, did it affect, must have affected her treatment and behavior towards you? Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, what sort of person was she? I'm putting it in another way. Well, as I said, she'd been brought up in a rather privileged way, mm. and um, and it meant that she didn't really have any skills. So she was completely dependent on my father, deeply in love with him, but in a in a in a dependent way. And um, she actually she tried to commit suicide. Uh, in the month or so after my father's death uh, by an overdose of pills. Uh, I didn't know the 
this at the time, but I was sent to go live with another uncle and aunt in West Virginia, actually, and was with them for six weeks till my mother recovered and came back. And my mother basically held herself together and controlled her drinking by and large until I went off to college. And then uh, when I went off to college, uh, she more or less collapsed and was in and out of treatment uh, and eventually died, I think, when I was in the beginning of graduate school. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it certainly gave me the realization that um, women who didn't have an independent source of self-esteem and a skill uh, were in trouble in the world uh, in terms of the, what they had to fall back on when uh, family and uh, external income was no longer there. So uh, it affected my idea of the kind of relationship I wanted to have. Mm. Uh, It's also, I think for any, I know there are support groups for people who uh, live in alcoholic families uh, these days in which people know a lot more than I knew at the time, but there was none of that available to me. Uh, but I did what, uh, eventually I did what uh, most people are advised to do in situations like that. That is to say, when I went to college and my mother was being treated again and again for alcoholism, we would have screaming confrontations uh, and so on all of which were you know ultimately failures in terms of getting her to stop drinking and at a certain point um, after four or five years of these futile uh, confrontations I remember looking at my mother and realizing that I could not change her behavior and that this was destroying me I can, I can actually remember it, um, maybe it's exaggerating a bit to say that it, was, it happened overnight or it was a particular moment, but I can remember very quickly withdrawing and seeing my mother as a sad victim uh, and with an objective eye in which I emotionally detached myself. Uh, and I think it was the way to save me, but it's not something that I liked about myself. Uh, a survival, necessary survival move, um, and one that's, I gather, recommended in uh, contemporary therapy. Um, I, there's a part of me that didn't like the idea that I now saw my mother as an objective victim in the world and not someone um, who's, who, someone whose fate and suffering I had distanced myself pay a price in coldness and withdrawal uh, from that. That's a very frank and good answer and very helpful. Um, I learned a lot from the interviewing um, Clifford Geertz about Clifford from his account of his very difficult childhood, mm. which is not dissimilar from what you've described. Ah. Um, oh yes, I know a little bit about this story <laughs> myself. But it's, it's um, and your father, just to finally finish, I mean, he died when you were nine. Were you close to him up to that point? In yes, I was very close to him. As a matter of fact, um, these were the old days when doctors went around uh, and paid house calls. Uh, my father had a sort of red roadster, and he took every opportunity to take me with him in the afternoons when I was out of school to go visit patients and so on. I spent a lot of time with him and came to admire him. He did a lot of, he was, um, how shall I say, he was a sort of bon vivant, but, uh, and like my mother, actually, this is one of their great characteristics is that they were, they actually believed that the world is divided into large spirited people and small spirited people, <laughs> and that, and, and I believe that if you're ever going to make a mistake, it should always be the large spirited mistake. Because <laughs> people will always forgive you if you give them a present that's too big, if you, you know, tell someone you love them, uh, and it's not, uh, those are always forgiven, but if you make a small-spirited mistake, um, people don't forgive that. And so my father and mother, the one thing that they bequeathed to me somehow is a sort of over-the-top large-spiritedness. Uh, so my 
my mother, for all her alcoholism, would have kind of given away, given away the house to the next beggar who came to the back door, and um, I found that. And my father was an authoritarian personality as well. So when my brother came back from his Quaker school, knitting blankets for the poor Europeans after the Second World War, my father took him out of the Quaker school, thinking he was going to become gay, and sent him to a military school, which is the absolute worst possible thing he could have done for uh, my brother. And I can remember once he treated a man for lip cancer, I think, and he was we were driving along, uh, and this man was a farmer. He saw the man uh, on his tractor smoking his pipe, and my father just stopped the car, walked halfway across the field, climbed up on the tractor, took the man's pipe and broke it over his. Uh, me without saying a word and walk back to the car in <laughs> silence. So you get some idea for the kind of uh, yeah, father right. I had, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, this was a country town, presumably. So wh what were your hobbies and what were you, what were you doing? Were you a, a nature, a rambler, a collector of objects? And well, you know, I was, a, um, I was a completely avid stamp collector. Some friends who did stamp collecting. I was partly in loyalty to my father. My father was a Franklin Roosevelt uh, supporter, uh, enthusiastic supporter, and out of loyalty to him, I um, somehow identified with the Democratic Party and the New Deal at uh, a very early age. So I, I was actually involved in local Democratic politics even as a young kid. Uh, hmm. Had uh, what we would call what's the what's the word. Um, pork barrel jobs working at the unemployment compensation office through the Democratic Party. And the other, um, uh, the fact is I, I actually had to work all the time. Uh, so by, by the time I was 11, my mother and I were loading lawnmowers in the back of the car and I was mowing people's lawn, I was doing their gardening, I was working for the Quaker school in the summer, I worked at a machine shop at nights on school days, uh, doing metal fittings for this or that. And so, the, and whenever it snowed, uh, another friend and I would spend all the time we could manage uh, shoveling snow. So I was uh, literally a, I worked, uh, and that continued all the way through college as a scholarship boy. This started when you were nine, when your father died and you needed right. the money. That's right. So I would, I had some, even though I later come to agriculture and animal husbandry, I could say, the fact is that my agricultural experience was picking corn and peaches uh, and tomatoes and green beans and cherries, but stoop labor along with the Puerto Ricans uh, mm -hmm. who came to work in, uh, it, it turned out that my part of New Jersey, one doesn't think of New Jersey as an agricultural area, but the fact is the waste of New Jersey is actually very rich agricultural land, and there were lots and lots. Well, my mother grew up on a farm outside this town, uh, and so I did a lot of agricultural labor, but it wasn't the labor that brought me to agriculture. Mm. Uh, I, I can't say honestly that I enjoyed it. Mm. It was a necessary way of earning money. Returning to the school, um, you said how important it was. From what age did you go to this Quaker school? I mean, from from second grade, which would have been age seven. Until? Uh, uh, until end of high school. Oh, right. So, seven and to it 17. Was, and it was, yeah, and it was a tiny school. So it meant that, uh, I don't know about your own historical experience in school, but people that you know from age six until 17 or 18, I feel, I've been to a couple of, a couple of reunions I know these people right down to the black little marrow of their bones. <laughs> uh, I know everything about them. I saw them every day, mm. year after year after year. And I know them a lot more, I think, than I know people who I'm very close to as an adult in some way. And, and of course, it's the same the other way around. Uh, they know me. Uh, and it's, um, uh, I find that very comforting, actually. I, have, I, I avoid reunions, but uh, I found that the 
two times I have gone to such reunions, uh, it's extremely satisfying to know that behind all the wrinkles and so on, there's that essential person that I recall from. Have you remained friends with any of them in the sense of corresponding and meeting up with them otherwise? Yeah, two or three of them. Mm. Uh, especially those of, you know, especially those of us who've had comparable lives. Mm. So one of my friends went to Yale as an undergraduate, became, uh, written some books on Italian cinema and so on, and uh, he, he was a dear friend in school and uh, uh, also came from a Quaker family, so I had stayed overnight with him a lot. He was getting the second Alice Paul Award uh, <laughs> in a month or so. Uh, and there are a couple of other people to whom I was close. One became a veterinarian, Actually, a rather good, uh, a nearly a professional woman soccer player, and uh, and then ran a successful business. And so I keep in touch with these people whom I'm rather fond of. I didn't realize when you mentioned Alice Paul Award Day, this was given to you recently. It wasn't a, a, an award you got when you were at school. No, 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 no. This was um, five or six years ago. Oh, I see. Four or five years ago. Well, then it makes it special. It's not so. Good. Yes, right. Mm. right. Were there any? Do you remember any of the names of, and the influences of any of the teachers at that school? Um, doesn't matter so much about the names, but was there anyone who particularly infused you, inspired you? It's obviously there weren't many teachers there. Yes, you know, it was. Uh, this was the world before there was career counseling and a special, uh, you know, special people whose job it was to figure out where people ought to go uh, for higher education. And I, uh, I didn't have a clue, nor did my mother have a clue. Um, and although I'd done very well at school, I happened to have a Latin teacher whom I liked a lot, uh, and he had gone to Williams College, and. I decided to go to Williams College because he'd been to Williams College and I rather liked him. Uh, I, otherwise, the other alternative was to go to Haverford or Swarthmore, which were much closer, just outside Philadelphia. No, Quaker. Swarthmore. Quaker schools. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, I wanted to put as much distance between myself and my mother as uh, it was possible under the circumstances. And Williams gave me a scholarship, and so I went to Williams. And I don't, I don't regret having gone to Williams. It was, at the time, I was an economics major mm -hmm. and, and, and political economy, a double major, and it had, and still has, I think, the best small college economics program in the country. So I got a fabulous education. I arrived, um, I arrived thinking that I was badly trained. I can remember that my brother brought me uh, to the first day of my freshman year, and uh, I realized that I was completely inappropriately dressed in a sort of uh, New Jersey high school kind of way, and I didn't, I hadn't, I hadn't even been next to a tweed jacket. Uh, <laughs> and I remember sitting down in a room where people who had just arrived as well and were freshmen were talking about artists and writers and poets uh, whom I didn't even know of, let alone have an opinion to contribute. And I thought, I am truly out of my league. Uh, I'm not going to survive here. And I remember calling my mother and saying, you know, Ma, I'll probably, I'll do my best, but I'll probably be home before Christmas. Uh, mm. I don't think I can hack it here. Uh, and I was, I was very, it was a rich kid's school. uncomfortable socially uh, at the school. It was also all men at the time. And um, it took me about three years before I decided that I belonged intellectually and was doing well. Um, and here I might connect this to the reason why I'm a Southeast Asianist when I say to creating false narratives of continuity just to show you what I have in mind. So I had an economics professor Emile Dupre, who was a great professor, only wrote two or three articles, but they were right, um, quite famous articles. And he had, uh, in, Ke 
asking around for a problem to hurl myself at as an economics uh, honor student. It turned out, I guess, that Germany in the early years of the war, when it had the manpower, didn't run double or triple shifts when it had, when it could have in its factories. And my job was to figure out why they didn't. Uh, and I knew enough German to make a stab at it. But it happened to be after three years of working night and day at Williams, in which I finally decided that I belonged, that I was uh, reasonably bright. And I relaxed for the first time to the point of falling in love and not doing any work in much of the fall. And I went in to see this professor and he said, um, he asked me what I'd done. And I tried to bamboozle him. Uh, I hadn't done much. And he saw right through me and he said, get out. You're not doing an honors thesis with me. You haven't done any work. You don't know what you're talking about. Get out. And so I realized if I was going to graduate with honors, I had to find someone to adopt me. And so the next day, screwing up my courage, I knocked at the door of all the other economists uh, at Williams. There weren't many of them. Uh, and finally, the third or fourth door I knocked at was a William Hollinger who had worked on Indonesia. And he said, you know, I've always wanted to know something about the economic development of Burma. If you work on Burma, I'll adopt you. And I said, fine. And under my breath, where the hell is Burma? Because <laughs> I, I truly didn't know where Burma was. Uh, and so I ended up doing an honors thesis on Burmese economic development. Um, and in the meantime, applying to Harvard Law School, because I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And so I got accepted at Harvard Law School. And then I won, on a lark, I applied for a Rotary Fellowship to Burma. And lo and behold, I got it. And so I thought, I can always go to Harvard Law School, but when am I going to go uh, to Burma? So I went to Burma for a year. Then... You're going too fast. Yep. Whizzing through your life too fast. There are okay. lots of things. I want to go back to school, even. Sure. Um, because there, I mean, you won't know, but I have a kind of agenda of things I like to... Sure. At school, um, I like to cover, if possible, sort of um, peripheral interests, in particular whether you had any interest in music at any time. Um, played it, listened to it, or whether it's important to you now. That's one of the things. Because that, that's, that's the time often where one learns an instrument. The shorter answer is no. My parents had, my mother in particular, but my father too, had aspirations for uh, at least a stab at music mm -hmm. uh, in, in the way in which you know, the piano in the parlor was a mark of middle class mm -hmm. status. And I had piano lessons, and I still have the first 16 measures of Greek's concerto in A minor, which <laughs> I could do, uh, and uh, that's it. Uh, and in fact, uh, I was not happy practicing the piano. I can remember we had a grandfather's mm -hmm. clock, not unlike the one mm -hmm. out in the other room. Uh, was that Foster's clock? Foster's clock. Um, and when my mother was in the kitchen, I would sneak up to the clock and move it 10 minutes ahead to minimize my practice time. <laughs> and then I would have to find another time to put it back so that it didn't just <laughs> get ahead. Um, so the fact is that uh, I regret. Um, I later took up the guitar. I'm very fond of listening to music, but I don't think I have a great deal of talent. What I do do is do, but that's late too, do a lot of pastel uh, drawing and painting. Uh, so I think actually I'm in complete envy of people who have at an early age um, developed either a musical skill or an artistic skill and uh, something to which I still aspire. Do you listen to a lot of music and what, what music do you listen to? I do. I do and I also, um, uh, mostly to Baroque music, my partner is a cellist and um, I can listen to her play box suites uh, till the cows come home. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the uh, and and my wife, um, as I said, who died twelve years ago, uh, she was she got a kind of classical education, and I was, I think, a civilizational project of hers that was relatively successful. <laughs> uh, so seriously. So, uh, so she brought me to opera, she was an art historian, she brought me to art, uh, and just living with her 
for 30 years or so was a kind of in, intellectual and artistic formation that was uh, remarkable for me. Uh, so I, in a sense, embraced uh, all of her enthusiasms and uh, ended up becoming fond of the things that she was, she was fond of. But I don't think, um, as, a, as a high school kid, I think I was far too anxious about whether our family was going to sink financially into the mud uh, or whether I was going to do all right in school. I think the, the, uh, the sense of the wolf at the door uh, was with me for quite a long time until I realized that my existential worries were, were greater than they need be. Uh, what about the sports and games? I was very fond of sports. Um, was a goalkeeper in, uh, in soccer. We were, since it was a Quaker school, we didn't play violent sports like American football. We played soccer, and we were rather good at it. Actually, we had a we had a um, uh, actually undefeated basketball season and a all but one game undefeated soccer season. Uh, but the, the match we lost was uh, lost by me uh, in a penalty kick that went through my leg. <laughs> which everyone in my school remembers and remembers. Uh, it was the humiliation of my, uh, of my high school career. But I continued to play. I play basketball with my children who are now you know, in their early 40s. Uh, and so I'm, I'm quite, quite, I don't think I'm a great, I'm, I'm not a very good athlete. Um, in fact, you know, if, it, if truth be told, I don't think I'm naturally uh, adept at anything in particular, but I tend to make up for it by brute fascist persistence. <laughs> uh, so I, for example, I'm learning Burmese now. It's hard. I started that at you know when I was 66 uh, to really hurl myself with Burmese. And I, I ordinarily I'm not a great language student. I'm okay, uh, but I find you know I've learned a lot of languages, and I find that. Sheer persistent application will will get you any language you like, mm. right? If you just don't quit. Uh, and so, I think you know I'm a, uh, a all around mediocre uh, talent with um, a lot of aspirations and endless energy and persistence. <laughs> right. Well, that, 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 the, the, perhaps the last thing that uh, you touched on it, but it's always interesting to reflect more on. You mentioned the Quaker background and at school 15, 16, 17 is often a time when one either takes to religion or rejects one's religion. Um, so right. how, how would you characterize your religious So trajectory? that's actually, that's not only an astute question but it happens to be fairly important. Uh, my father was an atheist, I mean, not just a quiet atheist, but a militant atheist. And I can remember going with my father to see an elderly man who was dying of cancer, who my father couldn't do much for except ease the pain. But I would go with my father, I saw this man with my father maybe five or six times before he died. And my father would just sit and talk with him for 30 minutes or 40 minutes and actually try to talk him out of his faith. Uh, at the end of this poor man's life, and my father didn't like the idea. It was a, it was a it was a pleasant and, and even affectionate conversation, but my father didn't like the idea that this man was going to his grave with these illusions. Uh, and so, so that's the kind of atheist my father was, um, and my mother was an agnostic, but they didn't have the courage of their convictions, so that they insisted that I go to Sunday school somewhere, although the Catholic Church was not on the menu. And so they drove me around, literally, this little town. There were five or six little churches. And there were some nice trees outside the Presbyterian uh, church. And so I decided to go there. And I actually liked singing. Uh, I was a sort of you know, child tenor, a child soprano almost. Uh, and then I became uh, the Episcopalian, uh, a.k.a. Anglican Church was close around the corner from where I lived, and I got to know, by shoveling snow, I got to know the priest at the uh, Episcopalian Church, and was very fond of him, and had a 
good friend who my age, and we were both fond of him. And so I became, uh, this is when I was, of course, all this time I went to Quaker school too. Uh, I became an Episcopalian, was confirmed, a uh, little you know, altar boy, uh, not eating before communion. This went on for about two hours, and I... Two hours? Two, oh, excuse me, two years. <laughs> two hours for two, yeah. for two years. Yeah. Um, and there is this, I don't know if this tradition exists here, of Sunday school, hmm. which is like a class. Yeah. Uh, and the older kids, among whom I was, had our Sunday school with their priest. And I was, thanks to the Quakers, completely taken up with Gandhi. And I asked whether Gandhi could go to the Episcopalian heaven. And the doctrine, at least then, was that if, if you hadn't known about Jesus Christ, you might have a sporting chance of going to heaven because but if Gandhi knew about Jesus Christ and did not accept him as his Lord and Savior, and therefore there was no place in the Episcopalian heaven for Gandhi, and I said, well, that's it for me. Uh, I don't want any part of the heaven that doesn't have a place for Gandhi, and I walked out of the Sunday school. Uh, my friend walked out with me. How old were you then? Oh, I would have been 15, hmm. I think, 15 or 16. Um, and I remained quite fond of the, the priest, didn't hold it against me, uh, we still shoveled snow for him and had long talks, so he was perfectly uh, gracious uh, about this. Uh, but that was, uh, that was the end of my, because I, I was very into uh, being a good altar boy and uh, a good Episcopalian until then. And now? Um, or in the subsequent years? I mean. No, I became, I think, after. Um, I taught at the University of Wisconsin for eight years, and there I decided to, uh, as a way of having a kind of community when we first arrived, join Quaker meeting there. Mm. And um, I went fairly. sort of lapsed, and I actually, um, I don't think, although the Quaker social gospel of Quakerism, uh, I'm, I have, um, although I admire the Quaker social gospel, I don't have any faith in a higher being, uh, and I find it, right, a little, I find it difficult to, uh, I don't believe Pascal that, you know, just mm -hmm. if you don't have faith, just get down on your knees five times a day and the faith will come. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that a bad faith performance. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, no, I'm actually, um, uh, I suppose if it were if I thought it were a matter of great moment, uh, I would be an atheist, but I don't much care about my lack of faith. <laughs> and so I suppose you would have to put me in the agnostic column. I saw, actually saw a bumper sticker that I rather was enamored by a year or two ago. It said, militant agnostic. And afterwards it said, I don't know, and you don't either. <laughs> and I thought, this is, this is a, this is a bumper sticker that I could subscribe to. Uh, so the answer is I don't. Uh, I don't have any religious faith. I don't think. You've worked mainly in societies which have a lot of Buddhism in them. I mean, do you admire Buddhist? No, actually, I, I know it's uh, a sound. Um, I find it actually astounding that. Um, I've seen Buddhism in action, and, and although I am greatly admiring of individual Buddhist figures um, and their acceptance and their distance and their benevolence, I actually find that it is a, um, you know, I 
see Burma, if you like, on its back as a country. And I see Buddhist figures who individually uh, may actually do some very valuable things in orphanages and so on. Um, but in a sense, the Quaker social action um, that creates civil society and provides the kind of passion behind it. You don't see this in Buddhism. I find it an extremely individualistic uh, form of, uh, of religion. And I somehow, you, I'm sure you followed the events of September and so on, and I, I found myself wondering how a different kind of Buddhism might have been able to bring about more successful results than the Buddhism, than I, the Theravada Buddhism. Mm. Mahayana Buddhism is rather different, perhaps, um, and Tantric Buddhism may be rather different as well. But uh, no, I'm not, um, and I was prepared. I was prepared to be, uh, and I spent a lot of time uh, in um, Watts and Abbey's, uh, because it's a great way of seeing the country but no, I'm not uh, taken the way so many Westerners are hmm. by uh, meditation and so on. Hmm. Thank you. Let's um, get then back to, well, to Williams College. Um, was, you mentioned the economists who taught you, were, were there any other people in the un, in, at that stage who you became friends with or who influenced you a lot? Yes, uh, I mean I was always, uh, if you like, having lost my own father, always on the lookout for father figures whom I could admire and who I would want to be like. Uh, and uh, I was, um, I was taken. There were, I was taken under the wing of two, uh, two people in the political science department. Frederick Schumann, who wrote a book on international relations, and it was nicknamed at Williams was Red Fred. Mm. Uh, and there were alumni who refused to give money to the college until they were retired. Uh, and I found his left wing politics to my uh, very satisfying. And he, I think, I took attendance at his large lecture classes as one of my scholarship students for which I was paid, and he got to know me as a uh, poor scholarship student who uh, did well, and so he, um, he took me under his wing, as I should say. And another one, another professor who was, I think, as a teacher, um, luminous in that he was a Straussian from Chicago, named Robert Gaudino, died a very, uh, died at a very young age. And, um, but he took the Socratic method enormously seriously and had these tiny classes that were filled with a kind of intellectual tension in which you were expected to be deeply engaged uh, with your uh, whole brain and whole uh, sense of feeling. And I can remember them as being rather frightening in terms of what was expected from me in terms of engagement in the classroom. And I remember there were some trustees who came. We were in a sort of elegant little uh, room of a house and the, the trustees came for a meeting and I remember him going um, in a purposefully dramatic way. When they came through the hallway, he went to the door and shut the door and said, they must never hear what we say here. <laughs> He was a kind of small genius. I'm, I've, I have, I don't think much of Straussianism generally, hmm. uh, but he, as a teacher, uh, was was quite remarkable. And one of the things that he did was uh, there was a Williams in India program, and it took Williams undergraduates, and I looked and participated. This began actually after I was there, uh, and they would live in a village. 
in India uh, for six months and they were preparing themselves by reading and so on. And after about five years of this enormously successful program, they realized that most William students, many of them from very genteel backgrounds, actually knew more about India now than they about their own country. And how did this develop a Williams in America program <laughs> in which people would put the undergraduates prepare to spend a semester living with a greengrocer family, with an auto workers family, uh, and so on, uh, or working at a hospital or a firehouse and as a public institution in a small place. And it was it was a completely brilliant program because I have a feeling that None of these Williams graduates who came, many of them from the thin air stratosphere of the social stratification. After an experience like this, none of them would have had something facile to say about the petty bourgeoisie or something facile mm -hmm. to say about auto workers because they actually had at least uh, lived that life. And I think that that kind of, um, that's in part the answer. Did you go to on any of these things yourself? No, I did, of course, do the Quaker things in yes, Philadelphia that I yeah. that I mentioned. But I, when I came back from Burma mm -hmm. after that year, and uh, when I began graduate school, I worked for I was a student political activist, and I worked for the National Student Association in Paris for a year, going to student meetings as a representative of this left wing National Student Association, and then I was elected to an office in the like NUS here in mm -hmm. Britain for another year, and then I went to graduate school. But when I went to graduate school, it was clear to me that I did not, I knew some Burmese then, but I knew I couldn't go to Burma. Burma had closed up then. But when, when did you first go to Burma? What year was it? Uh, 1961, when I started graduate you school. Tell me something about that year, because it's pretty important. Uh, Your, the first arrival of that war, memor vivid memories of were you in, in, where were you in Burma? Oh, back Rangoon, here in Burma. Rangoon? Or? Uh, I was in Rangoon. Um, I got involved in student politics on, uh, with a lot of minority groups. Uh, and um, I, again, I was, I was very active in student politics and I took this to Burma. And I actually, after three months or so, I got a death threat put under my door. I lived in a, something called the Old Staff Chummery uh, at the University of Rangoon. And um, uh, it said, we're going to kill you. Uh, and the Rangoon University Students Union was a kind of hotbed of radical politics. And um, as I said, I'm not brave in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and so within a week or so, I moved to Mandalay um, and went to the University of Mandalay to the new Staff Chummery there. Mm -hmm spent the rest of the year there working on, I thought I was doing economic statistics, but it turned out that statistics were completely unreliable. And after three months of trying to redo the statistical series, I thought, this is a crazy way to spend a year in Burma sitting in my room uh, working at uh, statistical techniques. And so I quit that and traveled the country and tried to learn some Burmese in the three months that were left. And I, I think that I, I feel that I bungled that year. Um, and the book that I've just done now and the time I've spent in Burma is, in a sense, an effort to, um, to do Burma right, to do Burma justice. And, that, and I might add, this is a theme of my life, that my first, my dissertation, called Political Ideology in Malaysia, that no one knows about, and correctly so, uh, was not a good book. Um, it pleased my professors. It was published. Uh, on the other hand, it was. It didn't please the area specialists, the people who knew about Malaysia. And so, Weapons of the Week was, in a sense, an effort to do Malaysia right uh, after having bungled it the first time. And, uh, and one could say the same about Burma. So it was my first time abroad. It was really hard. I lost something like 35 pounds in the course of the year. Came back real thin. And, uh, Did you find it a 
must, must have found it a beautiful place. I mean, Mandalay, although much of it had been destroyed, of course, there were still many temples and there were Irrawaddy and so on. Yes, and it was, um, I can still remember the, I don't know, the water festival in Mandalay. Um, I found it, you know, completely enchanting. I mean, I, I was perfectly happy then to devote the rest of my life to Burmese studies. And if I had been able to study Burma in the, in the, with the assurance that I could go to Burma, that's probably what I would have done. And my next choice was Chinese, but you couldn't go to China either. And so then I decided, well, if I study Malay Indonesian, it gives you four countries because it's not only spoken in Malaysia and Indonesia, but in parts of the Philippines and Thailand as well. So one of these countries is going to be open to me. And so that's essentially it was practical considerations like that that led me to study Indonesia. Mm. So you moved, you moved from Williamsburg, I mean Williams College, to what did you do your come back and do research at Williams College? I mean, I, I, when you came back to do a further degree... Oh, I came back to Yale. To Yale. I came back to Yale. So I, the, the sequence, although how important it is. I was going to go to Harvard Law School and I postponed Harvard mm -hmm. Law School for my year in Burma. And then uh, after a year in Burma, I realized I did not want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I would like to be uh, an economist. And so I applied to the Yale Economics Department. They accepted me. And then I had a chance to go to Paris and spend the year uh, as a representative of the National Student Association mm -hmm. going to meetings in then I realized in the course of that year, taking some uh, courses at Sciences Po, that I didn't, well, I wanted to be an economist, but they required me to go and take a couple of years of um, advanced calculus. I had first year calculus, and I didn't want to, uh, I had a chance to go to North Africa as part of a trade union delegation. So I asked them if they could allow me to do the calculus in in connection with my first semester. And James Tobin, uh, mm. who was chairman then, said no. And I appealed, and he still said no. <laughs> and then I said, well, why don't you send all my things over to the political science department and see if they'll have me. Um, and they did, and political science accepted me, and I went to North Africa and then became a political scientist rather than an economist. So Burma and Burma and political science are both vastly contingent events. <laughs> and Paris, you were, what, 22, 23 or something like that? Uh, I was at uh, Lanza Oriental mm -hmm. and Sciences Po. I, didn't, I, I wasn't a serious student. I was mm -hmm. busy running around to international student meetings for the National mm -hmm. Student Association. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a great, it was a fabulous year. It was a kind of... You know, the cosmopolitanization of Jim Scott. Uh, <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but it just gave me a familiarity. Huge international student community in Paris at the time, an uh, exciting time to be there. And um, it gave me also a appropriately jaundiced view of political science was then in the middle of its um, uh, positivist uh, empiricist. Mm. I mean, you know these people from mm. Bob Lane and uh, Robert Dahl and mm. uh, Ed Lindblom, and though I admire them all, it was a mm. it was a moment in American political science. Mm. Yeah. But they weren't in Paris. They were you were reading them in Paris. No, I didn't read them until I didn't know a thing about them. Mm. I was trained traditionally at Williams. I didn't know anything about the behavioral revolution when I arrived at Yale. Mm. The, all of this was complete news to me. Mm. Uh, so uh, I, uh, and I, in fact, I felt all these people, even though that's not the work they did, were like Jesuits in the grip of uh, a, uh, a view of how uh, intellectual progress could be made that I didn't share. But like everything in my life, I, I, I have to prove to them that I can master what 
they want me to master before I feel free to rebel. So it took me about a year and a half.